this morning as we are back at First John, and I'm just doing verses four through six, but this is very important. We'll be identifying two major categories, okay? Two major categories. John very much thinks in this way and writes in this way. We have to get this right or we won't understand First John. And the two categories we'll be seeing in these verses are lawlessness or abiding. And we're going to try to face this, each of us, today. Are we going to be lawless or are we going to abide in Christ? That's what the gospel is all about. So, um, actually, I've laid out the text in the second slide. Now, this Bible, Lexham English Bible, is very, very good. And it came to me through the Logos Bible software. Okay? Here's what it says. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness and you know that that one was revealed in order that he might take away sins and in him there is no sin everyone who resides it could be translated abides in him does not sin everyone who sins has neither seen him nor known him. I first taught verse by verse through 1 John in the early 1980s. And boy, it was a difficult thing to do because these categories, I didn't really understand them. Because earlier in 1 John, he said that if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. And here he says, if we sin, we don't know him. So it seemed hopeless. And so back in those days, there were different answers that were given. I never thought, excuse me, I never thought that they were such great answers. One of them was using the present tense saying, no one who abides in him sins all the time. Keeps on sinning, sinning, sinning. Uh, or, well, we sin, but we don't really like it. I thought, that's not a very good answer. What's John trying to tell us? How is it that I can abide in Christ and not be sinning? And so, today, I will show you what John is doing. And as we go the rest of the way through First John, we're going to see these categories again and again. And I have some slides to help you see this. And I hope, by God's grace, it's all going to make sense. Now let's go to verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Now earlier, I know it's been a while since I preached... But earlier we saw in 1 John 3.3, 3, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. All Christians are sanctified positionally and are wanting to be like Christ. We're willing, by God's grace, to abide in Christ because he's the branch and we're the vines, and if we don't abide, we're just going to be kindling wood. We're going to be worthless. And if we're going to grow, we have to abide. You'll see as we go through these verses that John is using categories that we also find in the Gospel of John. So we have to get this right so we won't be confused. So... Everyone who practices lawlessness is the one who is a rebel against Christ. Lawlessness, anomia in the Greek, is used in the Septuagint 
to describe Sodom and Gomorrah in the Greek Old Testament. The lawlessness of the city. God took Lot out so that he wouldn't be under the same judgment of the lawlessness in Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, if you read that narrative, they even were abusive to angels of God. Okay? They were horrible, wicked people. They did not want to obey God. They didn't even want to show hospitality to the angels of God. And God took Lot and his family out. Okay? So it says in Genesis 1915, now this is a translation from the Masoretic text. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. Now the Septuagint says you'll be swept away in the lawlessness of the city. The city says no to God and his moral law. And it was so bad that God brought exemplary judgment. But before he did, he took Lot out. Dear ones, the whole world is lawless in its rebellion against God. The whole world is saying to Jesus Christ, we will not have this man rule over us. That's lawlessness. John uses big categories. Martin Luther commented on this thing, this uh, incident in Genesis 19. Luther said, for even though Lot was not an officer of the state, but was a private citizen beyond reproach, nevertheless, if he had not fled, the sin of the city would have become his own, and he would have perished together with the rest. Now, we don't, under the new covenant, flee from one geographical jurisdiction to another, mostly. But when Jesus said, save yourself from this perverse generation, he's telling all of us that if we want to be saved, we're going to have to flee. I'm not saying flee America or flee Canada or flee England or flee France or flee Africa or flee, flee any geographical territory. God drove them all out. We need to flee from the man of sin who's not yet here, but his spirit is at work, lawlessness. John already said there are many antichrists in the world. Paul said that one who will come will be the lawless one. So we need to flee from everything that is saying to Jesus Christ, I will not have this man rule over me. That's lawlessness. If we flee to Christ, his blood is cleansing away our sin. We don't have to change any geographical location. We need to change from the dominion of Satan to God, from darkness to light, from Antichrist to Christ, from lies and Satan to the truth of the gospel. We need to flee lawlessness. Sin means missing the mark, hamartia. In this way, John emphasizes its seriousness. And so we'll see many cases like this. And next week is going to be the same thing. It'll be even more clear next week. I am so excited to preach John and 1 John. Now that these categories make sense to me. And it's easier to understand. We need to flee to Christ. It says in Matthew 7, <coughs> it says in Matthew 7, 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
Now that's defined as those who heard Jesus and heard his words and refused to obey him. Matthew 7, 26 says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. This citation in Matthew 7, 23 about lawlessness comes from the Septuagint of Psalm 6 and verse 9. Same word, anomia, lawlessness. So, as I said, Luke 19, 14 in a parable really epitomizes what the issue is. I will not have this man rule over me. Now, I'm trying because my voice sometimes is a little sketchy. I'm putting more stuff on slides. I told Christy, who else with this, helped me with one of these slides, I want everybody to get this, whether I can say it the way I want or not. I'm going to do my best, but it's so crucial that we get the gospel right. It's so tr crucial that we understand the Word of God. It's powerful. It's life-changing. We've got to understand it. So here, and if you have the printout, is an implication that I see from John's definition, sin is lawlessness. By defining sin... In this way, we can understand how John uses large categories. He sees people as either in the category of abiding in Christ by faith, confessing that he both defines and provides the remedy for sin, or in the category of lawlessness. Thus, apparent contradictions are resolved. Christians are not sinless, but they are abiding in Christ who takes away sins. I want this man to rule over me. I want him to forgive me. I want him to cleanse me. I want him to change me. I want to walk in the light. And I ask him, if there's any vestiges of lawlessness, get it out of me. If you look back in John 8, I mentioned at Sunday school last week, if you read John 8, you'd be well prepared for today's sermon. There were people who wanted to be disciples. And Jesus said, well, if you, if you abide in my word, you'll know the truth. Then in the truth, I'll set you free. They got mad because they didn't want to be free. Who are you to tell us what we need? That's lawlessness. Understand it. It's not hard. Once we get this, it'll all make sense. Now, if you're in the category of abiding in Christ, willing to submit to him, this does not depend on the relative, their relative piety, those who do that, compared to other Christians. That's what we keep getting wrong. Who's the better Christian? Who's more pious? Who's holier than thou? Who's found the secret? And we're sitting here comparing one Christian to another, and John is saying, no, you're either abiding or you're lawless, either or. Which is it? Now I'm going to show you a little later some implications of that. This is very, very important. Excuse me, important. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 5a from the Lexham English Bible. And you know that that one, demonstrative pronoun, by the way, was revealed in order that he may take away sins. Take away. Interesting word in the Greek. For it to just be pulled off and taken away, to fly away. In John 1.29, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away. Same word the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. When Jesus Christ came into this world, born of a virgin, who was incarnate, who walked among us, fully human and fully God, the pre-existent creator, when he came into this world, 
He created a crisis for everyone. Everyone who lived then, everyone who lives now. Because John was right, he was the prophet of God, like Elijah. There, behold, the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins. Is there some other way? Is there some other religious leader who's going to do that? Is this something we just sort of warm up to? No, we either come to Christ and abide and bear fruit or we're lawless. We're saying to God, whether we want to say it in such stark terms or not, everyone who doesn't come to Christ is saying, I will not have this man rule over me. I won't even admit I need to be free. I don't want to know John the Baptist telling me I need my sins taken away. I'm happy with my religion right now. That's it. That's the issues. He's going to lift up aero, the Greek, take away, is used in Colossians 2.14 for removing the certificate of decrees against us. Taking it away. Here we go. Taking it away. A preacher with a squeaky voice just doesn't have impact. But we've got to depend on the word itself, not on the guy trying to preach it. Here it means to lift up, to remove. In theology, we call this expiation, cleansing, atonement, redemption, removal, take away my sins. I think it was last week, not too long ago, we were saying, what can take away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Talking about redemption and atonement. So he came in order to, Hina, purpose clause, take away sins. Now I mentioned on this slide, John 8, 31 to 47. If you haven't done it yet, just read that. That just shows you so clearly John's absolute categories. It's how he writes. It's how we learn the gospel from the great apostle John. These people didn't want to be disciples if it meant admitting they needed to be set free. They ended up saying to Jesus, well, we're better than you. We weren't born of fornication. They insulted the Lord of glory. They said, Abraham's our father. We're important. Who are you? You're born of fornication. You're illegitimate. We won't have you rule over us. If we need you to be free, forget it. We were descendants of Abraham. Good enough. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. I'm asking everyone who hears this sermon today, has the Son set you free? Are you willing to abide in his word? Abiding is necessary. It's not a secondary step for higher order Christians. That's the error. Evangelicalism has been in grievous error because of pietism. We interpret everything to be ordinary Christians, higher order Christians. Ordinary Christians have mental assent and they're willing to sit in a church pew. Okay, okay, I guess I'm a Christian. The higher order ones, they're the ones who have totally surrendered and they're abiding. That's not the biblical categories. Somebody emailed me questioning my article about Chambers who taught a secondary experience of total surrender. And I rejected it on biblical grounds. And they said, well, I've been a Christian 45 years. Just now I'm willing to total surrender. Well, I don't know the heart. But I'm telling you what. If there is a total surrender experience, it's conversion. You can't say, I believe in Christ, but I won't have this man rule over me. Do you see the problem? You can't say, 
I'm abiding in Christ, but I'm also abiding in lawlessness. If we taught exactly what the Bible said, it would be clear to everybody why we need to abide in Christ. It's not a secondary experience. It's not something that makes you more pious than somebody else. It's conversion. Some will say, well, if that's the case, there aren't so many Christians. <laughs> it's a narrow gate, isn't it? Not because we're so great, but because few there are that walk in it. But as Peter said to Jesus, where shall we go? You have the words of life. Here's another slide that I hope I put here in case I didn't have enough voice to tell you. Those who are lawless either claim that sin is of no consequence, like saying whatever is done in the body doesn't matter. Some people, Gnostics eventually try to do that. Or that it doesn't, it's not really important. Or the good Lord doesn't care how we live. Have you heard that? Liberalism is telling us that every day. The good Lord doesn't care. Everybody has a right to be however they are. And that's just their business. And God will just go along with it. I'm not talking legalism. I'm talking conversion. This is conversion. If Jesus is the Lord... And he is God's prophet, as we learned at Sunday school, predicted in Deuteronomy 18, and he died for sins. Then, of course he's my Lord. Of course he rules over me if I'm converted. Does that mean I'm sinless? No, positionally, but not practically. But it means I long for his return. I long to be like him. Dear Jesus, come. We need you. Dear Lord, change me. And I need Christ. Some have defined away sin so that they won't have to need to obey Christ. 1 John 2, 4. But those, thus those who abide are staying put. In Bible college, one of my Greek teachers said, meno, the Greek word for abide or reside, can be best translated, stay put. That's what Peter did when he said to Jesus, where should we go? Only you have the words of life. Stay put. Where are you going to go? Stay put in Christ, confessing their need for his forgiveness and expiation. Second part of 1 John 3, 5. In him, there is no sin. Jesus is the sinless one, the holy lamb of God, God the son, the virgin born, God man, fully human and fully God. He offered up himself as the perfect offering for, for sin. Let me quote to you 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. What can take away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The holy, unblemished, spotless one came and died for sins. According to the Septuagint of Isaiah 53, 9, he is one who had no lawlessness. Same word in the Greek, anomia. No lawlessness in him. He was tempted, but without sin. Hebrews 4, verse 15. says in Hebrews, let me quote that. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, 
but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. That's our Lord. That's the vine that we're branches attached to. That's the one we abide in. Who is it that is free from sin? What person can be said lawlessness is what sin is? If you're in Christ, you have no sin. doesn't mean you don't have any sins, but that you abide. It says in Revelation 7, 14, And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. How is it that you're white? How is it that you abide? How is it that you're suitable to worship God? How is it that I'm suitable to worship God? How will he ever receive me? How will I ever be good enough for him? How will I ever be the kind of Christian I know I ought to be, and I'm pretty sure I'm not? What could wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Christians confess confess their sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses them from all sins. As you hear me this morning, are your robes made white by the blood of the Lamb? You notice the uh, play on words there? Normally blood's not going to make something white. But in regard to sin, the substitutionary atonement does so. Verse 6. Everyone who resides or abides in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has neither seen him nor known him. Here are these big absolute categories. We don't have to redefine anything. We just need to understand the big categories. Are you abiding in Christ by faith or are you lawless saying, I will not have this man rule over me. Which is it? Who's the Lord? Who's in charge? Who paid for sins? Who is it that speaks inerrant and infallible words from God? Is it Christ? Or am I going to decide it for myself? Don't try to do anything more with that. Just understand the big categories. The nuances within the categories, John deals with that too. Right now, we're thinking about abiding or lawless. That's it. Like in John 8. We'll see next week. John makes it even more absolute. Your father is either God or the devil. Somebody forgot to tell John to be politically correct. How can you say that? John. You're being so absolute. Don't you know that postmoderns don't believe in absolutes? Doesn't matter. Because John is an apostle who speaks for God. One of my scholarly sources says this is an eschatological reality. Let me quote him. Dr. Marshall commentary on 1st John. Quote, nothing, says Marshall, suggests that he had in mind a group of super Christians living a Christian life of higher quality than is possible for other believers. His language is absolute. And it refers to what is true of everyone. Let me quote some more from Marshall. I saw this in my own reading. What I'm preaching you today, to you today, I saw studying John and 1 John in the Greek. And I, in fact, I called Eric. I said, I think these are absolute categories. And we've always gotten it wrong. I hadn't read my commentaries yet. And I was glad to find a couple of them were seeing this also. It's a little bit comforting. 
I'm not the only one who thinks like this. But Marshall also says this. Quote, indeed, he protests against any claim by Christians to be free from sin. What he is describing here is therefore the eschatological reality. The possibility that is open to believers, which is both a fact, he cannot sin, and conditional if he abides in him or lives in him. It is a reality which is continually threatened by the tensions of living in the sinful world, and yet one which is capable of being realized by faith. See, understand this. Please, this is so important. We're pre-millennial. Eric's been teaching on Revelation. We've studied what's going to happen during Daniel's 70th week when Antichrist arises, the lawless one, who demands to be worshipped, who does signs and wonders in order to induce the wicked world to follow him. And he demands his mark, and he will martyr those who refuse to take it. So we can think about that, that end time reality. If I were living then, if I came to Christ during Daniel's 70th week, it would be obvious. I serve Christ and then take whatever happens or I take the mark of the beast and go into the lake of fire. And we can think about that and say, that's pretty clear. It's either or. So now, Antichrist literally is not here yet. John told us that. Spirit of Antichrist is. So we tend to think, well, now it's gray. It's not black and white. It's gray. No. It's just as black and white now. It's just not fully revealed. But it's still true. We're either under the lawless one or under Christ. We're either children of the devil or children of God. If you don't like hearing this, probably this room will be empty next week. <laughs> but if you want to learn more, come back and I'll make it even clearer. Either or. Oh, the postmodern sensibilities. You can't say either or. When I debated a emergent leader, he wouldn't even say there is such a thing as a literal heaven and a literal hell. There's just evolution. Everything becomes one. No, there's the lawless one and there's Christ. And if we are going to live in lawlessness, we haven't even seen him by faith. Our sins really aren't washed away. We really aren't serving him as the Lord. So many people email me and say, I've been a Christian for all of these years. They, they give me a number. And I have demons. I need somebody to break the curses and cast out the demons. Call me. Here's the phone number. Because I think you can do it. Somehow, I have to help those people see this. Okay? Whose servant are you? Are you under the lawless one or under Christ? And somebody emailed, well, can't Christians be possessed by demons? Okay? And I always send in my article, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Rescued, transferred, redeemed, forgiven. So I said, if you're transferred out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son, Christ is your Lord, you're in his kingdom, how is it that Satan possesses you? Uh, well, I can't answer that. What about the gathering? They had to find out there were 2,000 in the name of the demon to get it to go out. I said, no, you don't understand that narrative. So I sent links to a couple of sermons I did on that that we turned into a radio. No, it's proving 
that nobody is so bad off, so in bondage, chained in a cemetery, full of demons, full of curses, full of darkness, lost, sitting there with no hope, and people were just afraid of the man, totally delivered, put in his right mind, and even trusted by Jesus to go back and preach the gospel to his people. So I sent that to this lady who was trying to find a deliverance counselor. She said, well, I think you ha you're accurate and didn't want to hear anymore. Now, why does that happen? Here's, the, here's why. Somebody looks at their own life. I'm a mess. I got problems. I think I'm under a curse. I think I have a demon. Maybe somebody can fix all that. Say the right words. Rearrange the spirit world, get things in a little better shape, and everything will be okay. Because they're believing, I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. But see, if they're confronted with the fact that when you come to Christ, you are removed from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his son, then we have to start thinking. Well, I'm not satisfied with how I am. I think I'm that way. I don't like this. And so they hang up. They go to find somebody else. They find a curse breaker, a shaman. How many people think they're abiding in Christ and they're not? <laughs> Which is it? Lawlessness or abiding? Now, we're going to analyze what we've already heard in, in 1 John. 1 John 1 6. Walk in darkness, lie, do not practice the truth. Is that what Christians are like? No. Verse 7. Walk in the light, have fellowship with one another, the blood of, of Christ cleanses them. That's abiding. Verse 8, chapter 1. We say we don't have any sin. We deceive ourselves. There's no truth in us. We're like those ones that supposedly believed in Jesus. And he said, if you abide, I'll set you free. And they said, oh, we've never been in bondage. So why do we need to be free? There it is. Oh, I got something new. There it is. It came in the mail yesterday. I don't know if they can see it out, out there, but it's laser pointer. And I got it from eBay for $5.99. So it, it came, and Diane sees me down in the family room. <laughs> and she says, well, you're easy to entertain. <laughs> Five bucks, and I'm happy. So you say we have no sin or we confess sins. Do you see the either or? Do you see how John writes? Don't, do not keep his commandments. But well, otherwise we have an advocate with the Father. We have propitiation, which means appeasing God's wrath. Lawless, hates his brother, walks in darkness, abiding, Keeps his commandments. Listens to his word. Has the love of God. Walking in him. I'm just in chapter 2 now. They're not of us. 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 2, 1 John 2 10, 12. Loves his brother. Abides in the light. Doesn't cause offense. Sins are forgiven. 2, 20. 2 and 23, liar, antichrist, denying Christ. 20 and 21, 24, have an anointing from the Holy One. We know the truth. We abide in truth. Truth. We're in God. I don't think we can deny that these are absolute categories trying to deceive you. Have the promise of eternal life and abide in Him. That's how it works. Now here's how you go from one category to the other. 
1 John 2, 19. <coughs> they went out from us because they weren't really of us. See that? I will not have this man rule over me. I'm out of here. Here is conversion. Let me read that. 1 John 5, 4, and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. If you're hearing me today, and you have to say, in all honesty, I'm over here. Probably me. I've been religious. I grew up in a church. I don't mind going to church, but I don't want to hear all of this stuff about the need for conversion. If you believe in him, you trust him. God can take you out of here and over here. And you'll be in Christ. Whoever believes in the Son of God has life. Now I'm going to do some further implications and applications. Among those who do abide in Christ, we should not create needless comparisons. Number two, we should treat all who abide in Christ with love and kindness. Number three, abiding in Christ implies drawing near to God, not necessarily feeling near to God. Second Corinthians 10 in verse 12. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves, compare themselves with themselves, they're without understanding. So much of Christian teaching and theology is just that. So, pietism, I've written about that. You're just an ordinary Christian. I know the secret to being an extraordinary Christian. The higher life, the deeper life. Some prophet comes along, has it all figured out, and it's easy to get converts to that false thinking. Is your Christian life everything you want it to be? No. How's your marriage? Is it just perfect, shining example of every Christian marriage the way it should be? No. Do you always have nothing but joy, but some days do you have some sorrows? Uh... So you go down the list, and they say, we have the answer. You need to speak in tongues. You need to go to this conference and go through one day after another. In the end, we'll tell you how to achieve total surrender. And it's on and on and on. Every pietistic thing under the sun. I wrote one time in an article, there are no extraordinary Christians. But being an ordinary Christian is an extraordinary thing. I'm here to tell you, yes, we, we wish it was better. We do want to be like Jesus. But the question is really, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Is it going to do me any good to come into church and try to find somebody worse off than I am to make me feel better. No. 
Is it going to do me any good to come to church and find people better off than I am? Easier to do. To think, well, maybe one day I'll be like those people over here. That didn't do any good either. Because we don't know. God knows the motives of the heart. Looks are deceiving. The real question is, am I abiding in his word? If we are, these are eschatological realities. One day, we'll all be like Jesus Christ. And we won't have any crazy ideas about who's the better Christian. It won't even matter. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took away my sins. And yes, I would like to be a better Christian. But the only way it'll ever happen is to continue to abide. Those abiding in Christ will one day be with him and will be glorified. Every last one will all be glorified. And we won't be saying like Peter said to Jesus, John 21, 21, Lord, what about him? What about this man? What did Jesus say? Well, that's a good question. No. What's it to you? What's it to you? Peter was abiding. John was abiding. One of them died relatively young, was martyred. The other one lived to an old age. It seems to us, oh, that's such a big difference. Jesus said, what's it to you? It doesn't seem like a big difference now, but do you think it will a million years from now? In eternity? No. What will matter is that we abide it. Now, if we do abide, and we're going to see this as we go forward in First John, it's so important that Christians love one another. If we are abiding, we will love God's flock. The brothers and sisters we have in Christ will be precious to us. And we're, we'll be so grateful that we got to participate. Oh, yes. I remember when I was a brand new Christian in, in Bible college, there was an older lady, single and alone. Her name was Sister Salto. And every once in a while in chapel, she'd come and sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Join the heirs with Jesus as we travel to Sod and never fail to bring a lot of tears. If dear old Sister Salto has the body of Christ, she has what she needs. Do you know him? Are you part of the family of God? John 15, 12. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I loved you. Loved you. <clears throat> Christians who abide love one another. The world hates us. The world doesn't think like us. The world tells us we're crazy. The world says you can't believe those things. It offends us that you even believe like you do. But we have one another. God loves us, and we love one another. We are never in the category of lawless people who despise the people of God. That's how John was writing, because there were people who claimed to be Christians, but they hated the other Christians. They went out from us because they weren't of us. Let me read to you James 5 and verse 20. It talks about correcting someone who is a Christian going astray. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And we all know that love covers a multitude of sins. It's not loving to let a fellow Christian head off into sin. When we see someone we love who's part of the family of God going seriously astray, we try to save them. 
We try to bring them back. We try to show them God is love. He does care for us. He will keep us, but we can't run away. We can't run away. We need Christ. We need his people. That's God's commandment. Now, Hebrews 10.22. One last point. It's very salient for those who live in post-modernity. There's a great category in the book of Hebrews. It's called draw near. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us, interesting Greek construction. Normally, an imperative is in an imperative mood, but the author of Hebrews, who's Greek, they tell me, is utterly brilliant. Some of the best in the New Testament are just his ability to beautifully use the Greek language. He uses what's called a hort. What do I call that here? Hortatory subjunctive. I'm sure you all heard of that. Hortatory subjunction. Subjunctive. I can't even say it. What it means is this. Let us. Not saying, well, this would be a good idea, but not important. <laughs> Hortatory means having the nature of an exhortation. So he's exhorting his readers, let us draw near. Drawing near to God means coming to him on his terms. Oh, yes. And as God cleanses our hearts, even though we're sinners, we can draw near to God. Let us draw near. Draw near is technical terminology from the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, for example, Leviticus 21.17, speak to Aaron saying, no man of your offspring throughout their generation who has a defect shall literally draw near to offer food, the food of his God. If you were uh, an offspring of, a of Aaron, maybe you could be a priest, but if there's something wrong with you, you can't draw near. So it's, it's technical terminology for being suitable to draw near to God. Even being a Levite didn't necessarily make you suitable. You might have a defect. Here's the great glorious truth. <laughs> we all had a defect. Lots of them. And we were not suitable to draw near to God. No way. We weren't Levites. Most of us weren't Jews. We weren't anything we needed to be. And we were nothing but but defects. But now we're told, let us draw near. Why? Having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We have buried the old man. God has cleansed our hearts. And we now are suitable to draw near to God. Yea, he bids us draw near to God today. Come to him. Those who believe in Christ alone are cleansed from the inside out. So through the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ, those who believe on him are called and yea, given the freedom to draw near to him continually. It says in Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Today, have you repented and believed the gospel? The Lord is saying, repent, believe on Jesus Christ, trust him alone, and he will cleanse you so that you're suitable to draw near to God. Now, I won't spend a lot of time here because I'm out of it. 
but I, I hate to see an unshown slide. <laughs> Let me just say this. Paul comes upon a bunch of religious philosophers. We get a lot of them today in the world. Oh, we'll do this, let's try this. Or everybody has their own religion. Everybody has their own idea. It doesn't matter what we think, as long as we're sincere. You've heard it all. Somebody said, well, when I go out into nature, I feel close to God. Okay. Is there any value if you feel close to God in nature, but you don't know him? It's only salvation in Christ. A lot of lost people feel close to God. They go to the religious store to buy items to wear on their body to make them feel close to God. It won't work unless you're cleansed from the inside out by the blood of Jesus and draw near to God, you're still lost. Somebody said, well, I'm going to go back to the Roman Catholic Church. Why? I've had people tell me that. Well, when they do all the, but they, there's this big, the, 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 all the items and the tall ceiling and the priest and incense and all the, oh, it makes me feel close to God. Well, that'll do you a lot of good. Did you know that you can sit there and go to hell? I'm not being too rude. I'm telling you the truth. You can be in no building at all. You can be in the most utterly desolate part of an inner city with all the buildings around crumbling around you. And if you see the truth of the gospel, and believe on the Lord Jesus, and your sins are forgiven, and you're cleansed from the inside out. You are there drawing near to God no matter how bad it looks all around you. That's what's so great about the gospel. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you are, draw near to God. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and mercy that you've shown to us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we abide in him, therefore not be sinned. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.